this is sort of a little bit of, of, a, of a personal session for me because I, everyone out there probably, you know, some people are a lot younger than I am, obviously, uh, and are kind of getting into the game industry. But, uh, you know, I can remember when I first started working on games when I was very little, uh, obviously there were a bunch of things that were kind of formative in like my experience of, of making games and, you know, being just a kid who was at home, you know, typing away on the home computer and whatever. Uh, I kind of think back to like what inspired me to do stuff or what were the games I played that were like, I really want to make that. And by far the one that like comes to mind for me the most uh, was Secret of Monkey Island. And there's, this is true for a number of reasons. Uh, one of the reasons, obviously, is just because at that time, I mean, I think there's many, many people who consider that like one of the defining games of that time in gaming. Uh, but there was also the fact that as somebody who sort of knew a little programming but was pretty bad at it, Looking at that game and looking at the other games that were in its category at that time, I could actually see the difference in craftsmanship on that one, like even at that time. Because I remember, you know, right out of the box these things uh, would, would ship and they would be like, you know, uh, the Secret of Monkey Island game would be like this really fast, fluid experience and everything seemed to work great. And you would see like a you know, year later or something, you'd play a similar game there and you'd try to do something like click to walk and it would wait a while and then the guy would kind of do this really weird path that didn't look anything right. And I was just like, even at that time, I was kind of like, wow, like this, this is so much better than this. And I don't even know why, and I'm not sure I could do this, but this is who I'd want to be, right? Like, I want to be the guy who makes Secret of Monkey Island, not the guy who makes this other game, right? Uh, and so when I was putting together the, the people who I most wanted to have here, uh, my mind immediately went to that, and I was thinking, like, if, if Ron wants to come talk, that would be, like, the coolest thing ever, and I was kind of on the fence about it, because I'm like, well, I don't know, like, maybe he doesn't want to talk about this sort of stuff anymore, maybe he's not that interested in engine programming anymore, and so I go look at what he's doing, and he's actually writing, he said, because I thought Thimbleby will be parked, like, oh, maybe he's, like, managing that process, and he's like, he's actually writing a new adventure game system from scratch himself now, right? And so I was like, this is perfect. Uh, so I can't wait to ask him the questions that I've got here uh, and hear what he has to say. So please uh, join me in welcoming uh, one of my game development heroes, Ron Gilbert. <laughs> so I have, I have something just to prove that I'm not making the story up for crowd effect. I have here an original Secret of Monkey Island mouse pad that you gave me the first time I went to visit. You like had it in your office. Yes, I had a stack of those. I have kept this in like <laughs> pristine condition. And my actual Secret of Monkey Island 2 box, which for some reason I still kept this as well, it even has the original DRM people right here, a decoder wheel. <laughs> When was the last time you saw a game that needed a decoder wheel, right? They don't make them like they used to. Well, so, back, well back then, DRM was fun, right? It wasn't, <laughs> it wasn't just something that was annoying. It was something you actually had fun with when you started the game. They sort of thought about that process, I guess, a little bit more. How can we make this something that's not so, yeah. uh, so onerous, I guess? Whereas now, these are like, look. You're just going to deal with it. There's nothing you can do about it. Exactly. And you don't actually own it. You're just licensing you, you it. You rent now. it. Yeah. yeah. I, I would not be able to bring this today, would no, I? No, you would. You'd be violating several trademark and <laughs> copyright laws. <laughs> well, OK, that's kind of scary. I probably, probably shouldn't ask a follow-up question because I'll just get depressed. Uh, but I want to start out by just saying, can you take us back just a little bit to, um, uh, you know, at, to sort of start things off? Uh, I really want to know about, so Maniac Mansion was not a game I ever had, right? I mean, as a kid, you know, uh, I didn't actually have all, you know, every game or anything. Like, nowadays, it's kind of crazy when you're an adult and you have money. You can just get, if you want to see what Maniac Mansion is, you just get it. Um, but back then, you know, you only had certain games. So I never actually got to play Maniac Mansion, but that was kind of the start of the whole, you know, that's the whole adventure game, sort of like, uh, I want to say, the, the, sort of the genre that you pioneered, like yeah, that point, way of making point click games. Point the point-and-click point -click games. Mm -hmm. Uh, and so could you take us back to sort of like right before that, how does this start happening? Like, you know, what, what was your experience at that time? Why did you look at that and, you know, and say, I want to start making something like this? What, you know, and what was your sort of like skill set at the time that made you think like, I can, you know, I can do this better or I want to go do this thing? So can you, you know, just give us, set the stage? If you yeah, will. well, I, I was hired at Lucasfilm to, uh, to do porting. I, okay. they, they had built some games on the Atari 800 
and they needed someone to port into the Commodore 64. Okay. And that was primarily what I did, which is Commodore 64 programming. So I was hired to do port work. And I got there and I became friends with Gary Winnick, who was an artist um, at, at Lucasfilm, but the only artist at Lucasfilm at the time. Or there was the, just one artist? Group. Yeah, Gary. Okay. He did all the art for all the games. He, wow. was, okay. he was the only artist there. Just and like a newbie soft now. <laughs> <laughs> and so uh, he and I became really good friends. Uh, and uh, you eventually we became roommates and we you know, uh, shared a place together. And we, you know, we wanted to make a game. And, and I, at the time, I kind of felt like, because I was a contractor at the time. I wasn't even okay. an employee. Okay. And, and you know, I felt like, you know, I want to get a full-time job here. I mean, yeah. I was working at Lucasfilm, right, with right. Star Wars and George Lucas and, right. you know, all this stuff. It's like, I don't want to leave here. And so I thought, well, you know, maybe if I actually, you know, pitch a game and the game gets done, then I'll get hired on full-time and that'll be good. So, Gary and I started talking about, you know, uh, pitching a game, and we had this idea for this strange kind of, you know, comedy horror game with this weird family, and, you know, we talked about all sorts of ideas, and we had, like, no idea what the game was, right? We just had, we had a bunch of funny stuff. We had funny ideas, and that was all that we really had. Okay. And, and I think, you know, if I look back through my entire career, I, I think the thing that drives me creatively the most is fear. You know, <laughs> that's and, the second time it's been mentioned today. And and it's okay. and it's like when I get like terrified of something, it's like all these creative gears kick in, right? Okay. And so I was I was looking at all these great ideas that Gary and I had, and I had no idea what this game was, and I was just it was it, I, I was afraid, you know. It's like this fear was kicking in, and we a Christmas break came, and we took we we went on break, and I went down to you know to L.A. where my um, aunt and uncle live. And my eight-year-old cousin was there, and he had just gotten a you know Tandy computer, okay. and he was playing King's Quest. Okay. I had never seen King's Quest before, right? I, I played text adventures, you know, Infocom yeah. and all that, but I'd never seen King's Quest before. And I watched him play this thing, and it just everything just fell into place. It's like okay. this is what Maniac Mansion needs to be. It's it's an adventure game. So I, I came back after Christmas, just all energized, and that's when we just turned the whole thing into an adventure game at that point. And so uh, King's Quest obviously looks quite a bit different than Maniac Mansion, mm -hmm. because it's kind of, you drive the character around, mm -hmm. it's got a text parser, you know, you type in kind of the old Infocom style, so it's quite a different game. So when you came back having seen King's Quest, mm -hmm. it didn't go like, oh, we'll just make King's Quest and we'll swap in our funny ideas, and that's the game we're gonna make. So, how do we get from I saw King's Quest, which is actually pretty different, to, <clears throat> to me, to Maniac Mansion? Like, what did that process start looking like? What was the, did you start making a King's Quest clone right away and then start deviating from it, or did you iterate on it sort of like uh, as a, in a discussion first before you started making anything? Like, what, how did that happen? Well, the, the big thing was that I had played a lot of text adventures, and yeah. I liked text adventures, but I really did hate the parsers because I felt like I was always playing this game, which I called Second Guess the Parser, okay. is that I knew what this thing was, yeah. right? But, but did the game call it a bush? Was right. it a plant or a tree? I yeah. guess since we're talking about trees today. Yeah. You know, what, what was this thing? And you know, maybe the designer had put in a bunch of synonyms or something, but maybe they didn't get yeah. the synonyms I wanted. And so I said, you know, it's like, I can see this stuff, I just wanna touch it. I yeah. just want to click it. I yeah. want to say that's the thing I want to I want to interact with, and so that's kind of where getting rid of the parser came from. You know, it's like you know what we should just get rid of the parser. And the fact is that you know even sophisticated adventure games probably only use like five or six verbs anyway, yeah, right? Yeah. They're all just synonyms for stuff. So we kind of went through and we picked out the verbs that we thought would be useful, and those we just put them right on the screen. And so you just click on the verb and you click on the object. And that was kind of where the whole you know, point and click thing came from. Well, so how did you sort of do that process though? Because you know, uh, was that something that you thought of before you started programming the game? Or is that something that you sort of, like did you start making a parser and then go, wait a minute, we could do this? Or did you, was this just like you came back from King's Quest and we're talking to Gary and you guys just kind of figured this out before you even like started? Really, like what? What was that like? We we knew we were dumping the parser, and we knew we were going to the verb verb interface okay. before I started programming. So that was just already mm -hmm. in your head yeah. from Infocom days. It just kind of clicked. When you yeah. saw King's Quest, like, you were like, yeah. "We don't want to do that." And 
And Lucasfilm had done a game previously uh, called, uh, based on the movie Labyrinth. Okay. And they had done kind of a, a verb interface. It was like the spinning wheel thing. Okay. You know, it was, it, was, it was very clunky and it was cumbersome, but you know, that, was, that was a leaping off point for us, right? Okay. So it didn't come from absolutely nothing. It kind of came a little bit from the Labyrinth stuff. And uh, so it was clear enough from that that's like, yeah. this could work if yeah. we just do it a little bit. Yeah, let's just different. refine it and simplify it, and, and this will just be a much better way for people to interact with adventure games. So now you've got this sort of idea. You're like, okay, we've got the idea sort of for the story and the sort of things that we want to have happen, and we kind of know that we're going to do like this verb interface sort of thing where you click on stuff. But there's still a tremendous amount of like, you know, what is, how do we build a game like this, right? Mm -hmm. Because you're, my understanding there is you're coming at it never having, like, you didn't work on King's Quest, so you don't know what the internals of King's right. Quest look like. Mm -hmm. And unlike nowadays, you know, a game like King's Quest or something would be trivial to write or something like this, back then you're talking about, like, you know, it's cutting, like, things are cutting edge. Like, just having sprites move on a screen right, right. is like a whole thing. Yeah. So, Pi pixels are cutting edge. Yeah, pixels are cutting edge, mm -hmm. right? Uh, and so, what's your process now? How do you sit down and start approaching this problem? I guess we can maybe also ask a little bit, like, how did you get the game approved? Did you work on it in spare time? <laughs> what, what happened there? Like, like uh, I guess we should say before we start well, asking. you know, Lucasfilm back then, Lucasfilm Games, was, it, it, it was a very magical place in some ways, right? Okay. There was, there were, but by the time that we had pitched uh, Maniac Mansion, there were like 15 people okay. in the group. So it was very, very small. And you know, I think we, we were very lucky because I don't think George Lucas knew he had a games division. <laughs> and so right. we, we had all of this amazing autonomy to do you know, whatever we really wanted to do. And there was really no official approval process. The way it worked was you wrote you know, little, you know, one, two, three page design documents and we just passed them around, right, okay. on paper and everybody took notes and then things just kind of bubbled up until everybody said, hey, this is really interesting and okay. then they kind of became projects at that point. So, so it was sort of like a no collaborative buy-in sort yeah. of a thing where it's like if everyone sort of starts to think that this, this paper is one we should go with, then right. we will. Yeah, yeah, okay. exactly. So there was no, there was no real pitch to the whole thing. And so did you start making the game before that, or did you, did you start by making that document go like, you and Gary go, okay, we're gonna start trying to pitch it internally. Was mm -hmm. that the first step then? Yeah, it was floating that design document right. around and okay. getting support for it, which is you know, where the, the verb interface came okay. from, was kind of you know, Making that, that document. Yeah, but that was, I mean, that was probably like maybe a two month, a two month process of pitching that around. And then, um, you know, in, in typical fashion from a, a couple of guys that have no idea what they're doing, we just jumped right into it. Right? Okay. Gary just started drawing art and I just started writing code and we had no idea where we were going really with stuff. And, you know, and, and I think, you know, that's really kind of where the whole scum system came from, okay. the adventure game system, because you know, we took this path where I was just going to write this whole game in 6502 assembly language. Okay. Right? I mean, how hard yeah. can that be, right? How hard? So <laughs> I, just, I just started kind of doing that, and, you know, again, that, that fear kicked in as I realized I'm just totally in over my head with this. There's okay. no way we're going to be able to get this done, which is where doing, you know, a scripting language, you know, came interpreted from. language, you know, kind of came from all of that. Okay, so that actually sets up, like, Perfectly, the stuff I want to talk about. There. Yeah, I saw it on you. Yes, yes. Ah, <laughs> a professional. Yeah. Give you a nice segue. Uh, <laughs> so, looking at that process, right? You sit down and you're kind of going like, okay, we've got to start with some basic stuff. We've got to put some sprites on the screen, mm -hmm. and presumably, like LucasArts, maybe already has some stuff. You said Gary could start drawing art for it immediately. Mm -hmm. Presumably, there's some kind of pixel editing thing he right. can do yeah. or whatever. Yeah. So he's kind of making some assets, and you're, maybe you're getting some stuff on the screen. At what point, so what, did, what started, like, how do you sit down and start that process? Because the part I'm kind of interested in is, you know, nowadays if I said, I need to sit down and make a point and click adventure game, mm -hmm. I know what that is. Right. And I know exactly how it's gonna run, so I can sit down and debate a bunch of design decisions in my head or something, or start typing or whatever, and, and maybe follow John's approach and say, I'll just write the simplest thing. But mm -hmm. in this case, we don't even know what it is yet at all, yeah, right? It's a, it's a new genre. It's a new genre. So what literally, like, if you can remember, I know this is kind of a weird part of the development process, I can't even remember stuff I wrote in stream last week, so I, I realize it's hard, but <laughs> what do you actually start, sit down and start with? Like, what was the thing that we just started doing? I, I, can you give us any insight into that? Because I'm really curious. Well, well, I knew that the structure of the game was going to kind of be based on these rooms. We okay. called them rooms. 
and objects. Okay. Right? Those are the two things, rooms, objects, and actors. Right? Okay. Th those are the three things that made it up. Okay. So I kind of knew that I had to do that. I knew right. that objects had to appear in rooms. I knew I needed some system to be able to tag objects so when you touched them with the cursor and you know all that kind of stuff. Okay. I knew I knew that stuff. Okay. You know, in terms of the language itself, you know, I really didn't have idea what the language was going to be. Yeah. I mean, I'd, I'd kind of heard about Lisp and I guess, okay. you know, people were using Lisp for AI stuff and I okay. thought, okay, well this I should probably use Lisp. Right? Okay, okay. So, you know, my language was, looked very Lisp-like with lots of, okay. you know, parentheses and all yeah. that stuff on it. And I, I just, I very quickly just ditched all that. Okay. And I, I went to something that was a, a little more C-like, you know, okay. with like curly braces and stuff that was, I think, a little more saner for... for well, people. how did you make the decision? So, because this is actually an interesting part, too. So when you start working on this thing and you start coding up the actors, that sort of thing, that sort of... Uh, uh, part of it, I guess, you could start in 6502, right? You could mm -hmm. just start making the hard-coded right. versions, but I guess is what you're saying. You, you actually started hard-coding them initially. Mm -hmm. How did you first come to, you said fear, essentially. Mm -hmm. How did you first make that leap of like, you know what, if I had an interpreted thing here, this would work? Because that's not, again, now that might be an obvious decision, because right. maybe you have awareness of all these things, but at that time, that is not an obvious thing to think of necessarily. Mm -hmm. Had you seen other games do this? Did you have some experience in the past that made you think this would be a good idea? Like, how did that thought come in? Yeah, that, that came from a guy named Chip Morningstar, and he okay. worked uh, at Lucasfilm, and uh, he and another uh, person at Lucasfilm named Randy Farmer um, they, they went on to create uh, Habitat, which is probably the right. world's first graphical it, MMO. I remember that. And I mean, Chip was just like an uber smart guy. Okay. And, you know, I was just kind of talking to him about the whole problem, and he just kind of said, hey, why don't you do a scripting language? Okay. It was just something he threw out there. Why don't you do a scripting language? So he just knew about it from some yeah, other yeah, situation. I mean, and, okay. Yeah, I mean, you know, at the time, Infocom had a scripting language, yes. right? I mean, they didn't code their stuff, yeah. and, you know, Sierra had one as well. Yeah. So, I mean, it wasn't something that was totally under right. before. Um, but, you know, getting a whole, you know, compiled scripting language working yeah. on a Commodore 64, yeah. you know, there's 64K of memory <laughs> yeah. in this machine, right? Yeah. And so that was, you know, that, that was something that I went really on a, on a Commodore, you know, that, yeah. I think that was the leap I had to make, was yeah. building in a whole interpreted language that ran on this little 64K machine, you know, I kind of had to convince myself a little bit that that, that, that was Was possible. a good idea, yeah. yeah. Well, and so, in deciding to take that step, uh, was really what you were thinking there is like, okay, if we had a scripting language, it will be easier for me to script, or was that more of a decision like, if we had a scripting language, other people could start tweaking the other, which, because later on, it probably that, that thing changed, but at, in Maniac Mansion, what, what was that decision Yeah, like? in, in Maniac Mansion, you know, I was very idealistic, okay. you know, at the time, and, uh, you know, I kind of thought, you know, I'm gonna build this scripting language that's so natural, you don't even have to be a programmer, right? Okay. That, that you know, I can hire like writers, right. and they can come and they can use my scripting language and they can build these games because okay. this thing is just so brilliant, you know, that it's, it's not even like programming. They just describe the game and yeah, it just and creates it just itself. understands yeah. it, right? You know, and how hard can that be, right? And I'm so, a Commodore 64, <laughs> yeah, plenty of horsepower. You know, so, so, I mean, that was kind of my, my initial thing. And, and if you look at the scum language, you know, the, the commands in it are very verbose okay. because I was trying to make things be very clear about, about what was happening uh, with, with stuff. So you kind of want to look very English-like. Yeah, exactly, you know, and so, so a lot of the commands in the language are kind of like that. But, I mean, at some level, you, you just can't get over the fact that whoever is doing this needs to understand basic logic, right? Yeah. They have to understand, you know, if, if then statements yeah. and all of this stuff that goes on and there's just no way around that yeah. kind of stuff. So, you know, the language can be kind of verbose and, and you know, English-like and very freeform in its structure. You know, you didn't, you didn't pass a bunch of anonymous parameters to functions. You know, instead you said actor at, and then you could just put okay. costume this and just, you know, run on all of your stuff across it. So, gotcha. you know, that's why it was, it was kind of a verbose language and it didn't, it didn't look very programmery. Now, you're gonna make this scripting language for the game. Mm -hmm. Obviously, you know, nowadays it's like, oh, well, you know, we're gonna type the script in the script window and mm -hmm. then it's, the game's running and we'll just alt tab between them or they're uh -huh. on the same screen or my multi-monitor, right? Right, right? But we're talking about a Commodore 64 right. situation here. So 
how does that, uh, like, what, what did that process look like at the time, too? Because now you're like, okay, how are people making these scripts, and how does the turnaround time look like? And I think, like, again, it may not be that relevant to the, to the programming of it so much, but it's kind of interesting just to think back about mm -hmm. how constrained that was. How did that process go? Like, what was that like at the time? Well, we, we, had, a <clears throat> we had a wonderful development environment. Really? And the, the Lucasfilm Games Group was, was kind of spun off or a part of the Lucasfilm Computer Division, which later changed their name to Pixar. Oh, right? okay. So, those so, are... so all those people, you know, they, they all kind of worked in our group. And so we had these, like, really, really smart people. And, uh, you know, Lucasfilm, the whole entire company ran on these big mainframe, you know, Vax machines, you know, Unix machines and everything. And um, one of the things they did was they, they built these little things that literally plugged my Commodore 64 into the Vax Unix machine. Really? I would, I would plug the thing in, and then I worked on a Unix terminal on my desk, and I had complete control of the Commodore 64. I could pause it, I could download stuff to it, I could upload stuff to it. So I never programmed on the Commodore wow. 64. It was all done on these big Unix machines. I had which, no idea. Which was very useful because <clears throat> Scum was a compiled language. Yes. And so the compiler ran on the Unix machines. It didn't run on the Commodore 64. So the whole compiler and the art pipeline and all that stuff just happened on the Unix machines. And then we just download everything to Commodore 64. And it was nice because we could do a lot of hot loading stuff, right? We could just run things down to the machine you know, while I was running, and this was, you know, in, in 1986, yeah. right? And that was <laughs> very, crazy. very, very different. You know, it's a lot like it is today, but very, very different than what was happening back then. Yeah, that's actually incredible. <clears throat> so does that mean that somebody who was working on a particular room for the game uh, could literally have a <clears throat> Unix thing open, modify some scripts, and in a relatively short period of time, see the result? Almost instantly. That's insane. Ron. Almost insane. That is insane. <laughs> yeah, because we would we would just we would just push the script down. And the other thing about the Scum system was, you know, the Commodore 64 had 64k of memory, right? But a lot of that was taken up with the program. Yeah. And uh, you know, I actually had only 19k of memory free okay. for all the assets in the game. Okay. And so, you know, what I what I had done was I wrote. Um, actually, Chip had written it because he was starting to work on Habitat at that okay. time. So he wrote this wonderful memory management system where you know all the assets in the game were kept on this little heap. Okay. And the system was smart enough to understand that, okay, this stuff's old, no one's using it, flush it out. And if I bring in new stuff, just spool the stuff out of memory while the new stuff is brought in, right? This is not a Commodore 64, right? That all this stuff is happening. So, you know, the whole game is just kind of, you know, almost open world continuously playing yeah. while stuff is just spooled in from the disks. Okay. And so it made the debugging very easy on the, uh, from the Unix thing because we had all these assets, whether they were art or scripts, we could just pump a new one down to the heap. And it would just it would just work right there on the thing. So it was a very, very quick development. So you literally on the Commodore 64, mm -hmm. running on the Commodore 64, mm -hmm. had hot loadable assets yes. Yes. during <laughs> without restart. Yes. It just keeps running and you could swap like the guy yeah. with a new bitmap. Yeah. That's that's <laughs> kind of crazy. <laughs> I, I don't even know. All right. I have trouble getting that working today on my <laughs> yes. machine. Yes, yes. Uh, we, did, we did have to re-kind of enter the room you were in, right? So uh, it wasn't just magical. We had to do a quick re reload. But, I'll, I'll but we still didn't give have that to, one to yeah. you. I'll, I'll give that one to you. Yeah. Wow, OK. Uh, well, so I guess scripting language-wise, how did you approach that problem? I guess I should keep track of time, because I kind of wanted to talk about two things. It looks like we've, we have plenty, so we're good. Um, so tell me a little bit about how you approach the scripting language problem, because mm -hmm. like you said, if that was something that sort of someone said, hey, why don't you do a scripting language? You're like, oh, maybe that's a good idea. How did you know, I mean, even how to build such a thing, right? Mm -hmm. Did you have some experience with scripting languages? Did you like go get learn scripting languages in 20, 31 days or whatever it is? I'm sure that was a popular <laughs> book at the time. Like, did you, like, how did you even know how to build one? Because, you know, again, back mm -hmm. then, we take it for granted now that if I want to learn how to script, I type it into Google, how do I build a scripting language? Right. And there's some tutorial. That's not the case. So mm -hmm. how, what did that look like? Well, that looked like a, a couple of things. When, uh, you know, before I got my job at Lucasfilm, back when I was in, um, I guess, high school, I got a Commodore 64. Okay. You know? So that was, that was, you know, I, I'd learned programming on the Commodore Pets and some other stuff, but the Commodore 64, I got one of those, and I just thought this was 
you know, an amazing device. Um, but the one problem I had with the Commodore 64 is it had really great graphics, had wonderful, you know, SID chip for doing audio. None of that was accessible from BASIC. Right. Not a bit of it. Right. Right. If you wanted to access that stuff, you did like peek and poke commands, yeah. you know, to hit the memory. It was yeah. just super, super cumbersome. Yeah. And, you know, I thought it would really be nice if, if there was actually a basic language on the Commodore 64 that could take advantage of all these graphics, I right? See. And one of the things I realized when I was hacking around with the machine is there's, there's like 20K of ROM in the Commodore okay. 64 where the basic contributor sits, but there's 64K of RAM. So you could you bank out the ROM and then you have uh, 64K of RAM to play with, like if you don't need the basic interpreter. Okay, so basically, <clears throat> normally the 64K, when the machine starts up, the 20K of ROM mm -hmm. actually gets moved into the 64K of memory? No, the, the ROM or, actually sits right above it above in the it. same okay. address space. Okay. But what I kind of realized was that if I read a byte out of the ROM and then I wrote it back to the ROM, it actually wrote to the RAM underneath. So what I did was I went through and I copied all of the basic ROM, writing it right back out to itself, banked out the ROM. Now I had the entire basic interpreter I see. in RAM. And you can modify and it. And so I started playing with it, and I built this whole extension to the basic language called Graphics Basic. Okay. And it added sprite commands and line commands and sound commands. And I think, I think it's kind of where my love of languages Came started. from? Yeah. And so when I started doing the scum stuff, I kind of had this whole experience with, with graphics basic, you know, of, of what a language looks like and how, you know, I understood how basic interpreted the language because I'd hacked into the whole thing and figured it wow. all out. So when I was working on the okay. SCUM system, I kind of, I knew, you know, what it was like to go through and, you know, interpret opcodes and, and all of that kind of stuff. That I had already figured out. Yeah. Okay, so basically your experience with, with essentially disassembling BASIC, I yeah. guess we would call Which it. Which I right? did. I, I printed out the entire BASIC ROM. Okay. You know, I remember sitting on my bedroom floor yeah. with these giant printouts and a pencil, you know, writing comments, because, I mean, there was, yeah. it was not, there would, there were no yeah. comments, right? It was just assembly code. And so, so from that. that, you learned how they had done yes. their interpreter. Mm -hmm. And so now you knew, here's how I can make an interpreter. Right. That's yes. amazing. Yes. OK. So, <laughs> OK. So uh, you, you sit down to make the scum version of the interpreter. Mm -hmm. And you're just like, OK, so I'm kind of going to pattern after what I learned from BASIC. And we're going to, you know, we have the Unix terminal, so we're going to make the stuff that compiles down. Mm -hmm. how, you know, how long does that take to get working? Like, how, when does that start to come online? Like, how much of a process was that? Uh, you know, that, that took quite a while. It, you know, it, was, it, it, it probably took me about a year okay. from the point that we started working on it till we had a system that we were actually building a game in. Okay. And, you know, I, I mean, I know this isn't actually true, but it feels like I almost got fired. Okay. I mean, I, I okay. definitely remember being called into my boss's office and having a talk okay. about how long Maniac Mansion is taking okay. and is this thing ever going to turn into something. Okay. So it was definitely taking a long time. And I was, I mean, that was just pure inexperience, you know, at building, you know, what, what we were trying to build. To build, well, yeah. sure. And it's very ambitious for the time, it sounds yeah. like. the hooking it up to a VAX machine is not <laughs> yeah. something I think most people are doing either. But. No. Uh, so um, I want to take, just before I move on, because I want to talk a little bit about what you're doing now as well. Mm -hmm. And so I wanted to ask one other question kind of to set that up a little bit, which is that one of the things that I mentioned kind of in the introduction as well is that one thing I noticed about the, the LucasArts games kind of right from the very beginning. So I, like I said, didn't ever have a chance to do Maniac Mansion, but certainly in Secret of Monkey Island and in everything that sort of came after it until, I don't know, maybe something like Grim Fandango where they went back to maybe like direct control. Mm -hmm. uh, I felt like the click to move implementation mm -hmm. in those games was much better than everyone else's click to move mm -hmm. implementation. Maybe that's just complete misinterpretation of what I saw, but. No, you're right. I, <laughs> <laughs> but I wanted to ask about that problem specifically. Mm -hmm. So at some point, and I guess I don't know what this point was, but at some point you decided, I don't want to drive this guy around. I want to just be able to click to move right. him. Now, was that something you decided early on or late on? What that, was that was early on. That, that was a okay. part of the whole point and click interface was we just wanted okay. to touch everything. We didn't have a mouse. The Commodore okay. 64 was a joystick. Was a joystick. Yeah. But you know, we knew we wanted to move the cursor around, and everything was just clicking, clicking on the screen. Things. You click to walk, you click okay. to interact. So that original design document d either includes, or when we were making it, we already had thought of, we don't really want you to drive this guy. We want right. you to click. 
Okay. Mm -hmm. Uh, which I guess makes sense because if I already have to be clicking on the menu things, what am I driving yeah, with? Exactly. I can't, and so it's kind of forces the issue almost. Mm -hmm. So you have to approach this problem now. It's like, okay, this is actually quite different than basically mm -hmm. anything that I see at games at that time. Mm -hmm. All other games are, are pretty much direct control, whether it's an arcade mm -hmm. game or a Sierra game, you're driving the guy around. So mm -hmm. how did you approach that problem initially? Was it a big deal for you or was it something you just did? Like, what, what was the mindset there and how did that go? Well, the, the issue is obviously pathfinding, yes. right? <clears throat> is, I, you know, I wanted, I wanted to be able to click anywhere on the screen, and I wanted the character to figure out how to get there. Yes. Right? If it was possible for the character to walk from point A to point B, and he had to walk around the table and between some chairs and, yeah. you know, around the lamp, I wanted him to do that, yeah. right? I didn't want him to walk in a straight line and get stuck, you yeah. know, against the dining room table right, right. and walk around the table. So that became, you know, a, you know, a pathfinding issue. And, you know, I don't, I don't, exactly remember kind of the genesis of, you know, how, how it all came about. But we used a system which, was, which we called walk boxes. Okay. And, and what it was was, you know, if you, you think about the room, yeah. you know, it's, it's kind of a flat, but think about the floor of the room. Yeah. And I, I would just put these boxes, and they were literally squares, okay. right? Because we didn't have the CPU power to even have angled lines right. and figure out, you know, the intersection. So some kind of rectangle. So they were boxes, yeah. you know, the walk boxes, and I, you would just, you would just, I would just put them on the floor as many of them as I needed, yeah. and you know, make sure that there was an overlap, you know, on them of the lines. Okay, so <clears throat> all of the rectangles are slightly overlapping. Is that what you mean? They're, they're, they share a pixel in common. So exactly, exactly overlap. They, they, they osculate at this point, if you yes. will. Okay, all right, yes. okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and then, and so you have all these boxes that litter the floor about where you can walk. Now, the hard part is, like, well, how do you path through right. them, right? And, and today, I mean, you just don't worry about right. it, right? You do some yeah. A-star thing or, yeah. you know, whatever it yeah. is. But you just didn't have the CPU you know. on a, wait, a .8 you know, megahertz, yes. you know, 6502. So, um, you know, the, the idea that it came up with is you just do a lot of pre-processing on oh. it. And, and, and so I had all the boxes. It was like box one, two, three, four, five, six. Okay. And I had this two-dimensional grid, and you you look at the box you were in, so you were in box one. Okay. You wanted to go to box eight. Okay. So you just, you look up in the grid, you know, okay. box one, I want to go to box eight, and that number right there was the next box you want to walk into. Okay. Okay. So and, and so then, and I knew those connected. They had to. Right. So then it was very easy to find the connecting line, and then I would just walk to the center point of the next box. So that's like Dijkstra's algorithm. Did you know no, that at the time? not at So all. you full on just figured it out yourself? <laughs> not at all. Not at all. <laughs> And, of course not. And that, and that little matrix, yeah. and that was something that we, we had to build by hand. Okay. Right? We didn't, that wasn't pre-processed. We'd lay down all the boxes. And you just And we'd them into in. the text editor, and we'd lay out that little grid of where you could go. So it was, a, it was, it was kind of a, a cumbersome process to set up walk boxes. But, but the end result in the game yeah. is instant movement. Yeah, exactly. So basically, you would click somewhere. Mm -hmm. It would know that's in, well, first of all, it would just look to see through all the boxes. If it ain't these boxes, if it's not in a box, you're not going to go there. Right. Mm -hmm. Or did it try to go as far, close as it could? It tried to do, it tried to go as close so as it So how did that work? Did you just um, find the closest box? It was, it was, it, ba it was a vertical line. Okay, so it basically said, like, it keep searching until we get to until something. You get a box, yeah. So I find a box there, and then I basically set some global, you know, not global, but some state for this actor that's like, this actor is trying to go to box blah. Mm -hmm. So every time his box, you know, every time I update his movement, I go, what box is he in? Mm -hmm. Figure out the direction to the next box and go. Well, how does that, how are you encoding stuff like that? Like, what direction go from box to box? Was it, it, was, just... it was really just straight lines. Okay. Stuff. And, you know, you had to be clear careful on your boxes because yeah. I knew that what, what the actor was going to do was go from the point they were standing to the midpoint of where the two boxes intersected. Okay. And so I just kind of had to make sure, I mean, sometimes, you know, we'd have to put a couple of extra boxes, boxes in just, just to, to make, make it, it look feel, a little bit you know, feel right. Okay. But it was, I mean, it was pretty brain dead, you know, what I was trying to do. <laughs> that's, well, so that's like a mystery that I've, I've wanted to know for, I guess, what, 30 <laughs> years now? So yeah. thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it became a, a little more sophisticated. You know, by the time Monkey Island rolled around, we could do trapezoids. Okay, so to try, just to make less boxes, so they yeah, could fit so we could of. do like trapezoids and okay. stuff. And you know, it, it slowly evolved oh. over time. You know, stuff. So let's jump forward now mm -hmm. uh, to Thimbleweed Park, mm -hmm. right? And you're going to uh, uh, 
this is the only question I think that I've asked you beforehand, so I kind of a little bit know the first answer, but everything else I don't know. Uh, so you're going to make another adventure game. Mm -hmm. And obviously, like, I mean, to, to drastically exaggerate, if you wanted to, you could literally go get someone's re-implementation of your thing, which <laughs> yes. is probably in the public domain now yes, if you wanted scum, to, right? Scum VM. Some scum VM you could use. <laughs> so when you sat down uh, mm -hmm. to make a new adventure game in, like, what, it was it 2014 or 2013? 2014? Uh, December last year. December last year, okay. Mm -hmm. so, uh, so 2014, uh, you're like, I'm going to make a new one. Mm -hmm. How did that decision, like, how, what, what was the motivator for that decision? Uh, the motivator was, again, it was Gary Winnick, you know, yeah. he and I were just talking one day about adventure games, and, and we were talking about modern adventure games, you know, versus kind of the old classic yeah. point-and-click games, and it really kind of, you know, it felt to me that adventure games have lost that charm okay. that, that they had back then, okay. and, and I really wasn't sure why okay. they had. But it, it just felt like they kind of lost that charm. Okay. And so Gary and I were talking about, you know, what, what that was. You know, maybe it was just our innocence of the time. Yeah. Maybe it was that it was a brand new genre and it was just magical and yeah. it was just not anymore. We just so when you said that charm, you don't really even know what it I don't was. Know what that You're is. just like, I felt like there was a charm here and that charm is definitely gone. Yeah, I, I have no idea what that is. Okay. And, you know, we were just kind of talking about that and, and we didn't really know what it was. And, you know, we started talking about, well, we should just make a new one. Yeah. We should just make one exactly like we made them back then, with and the see. same sensibilities, the same, you know, kind of art style, everything, yeah. and just see if we could capture that charm. Yeah. Or maybe that charm is, has just been lost to time, yeah. you know, in some way. And, you know, so one thing led to another, and we decided to do a Kickstarter for it. Okay. Um, you know, Kickstarters kind of based on nostalgia tend to do very well. Yes, you know, that's true. So, so, you know, we figured, well, we've got kind of a perfect you yeah. know, opportunity to do this. So, you know, we, did, we just did a Kickstarter on it, which was successful. And we really have approached the game very much as, let's just pretend we were back in 1987 okay. and we're making a point and click game. Okay. Let's just use all the same you know, ideas that we had uh, back then and see if we can somehow you know, recapture that, that charm in kind of the way we design it and the way we build it and the way we kind of think about the game. And so building a new system for it is kind of part of that whole mentality. Uh, would that be an accurate statement? Meaning like, we want to create a new VM, for example, because that's what we did, and we're going to do that again. I mean, it wasn't specifically that. I mean, okay. I did spend a little time looking at current adventure game okay. engines to see if any of them you know, would do what I needed. Okay. And I, I mean, I very quickly discarded that. And, okay. I, and I, think, I think most of it is, I mean, I, I love building game engines. Right? Okay. I, I mean, I kind of think in some ways, des, you know, when, when I design a game, it's really just an excuse to build a game engine. You know, <laughs> that's, that's all it really is, right? And okay. so, you know, I think a, a part of that kind of recapturing everything was, you know, I, you know, it's, it's like what we kind of promised to the Kickstarter backers was, you know, they can relive playing a classic adventure yes. game again, kind of like, you know, the, there was this game we made back in 1987 that had just been discovered, right? right. That they can relive it. But I, but I think in a lot of ways, it was more, it was more about us being able to relive <laughs> making, making it. The, the classic game again. And, you know, I, I do love making, you know, game engines and adventure game engines and that kind of stuff. So, so that, that became a very enjoyable part of the whole process for me. And so uh, when you started building, you know, this, this engine from, mm -hmm. uh, for the new game, what, like, and I guess it's a little bit difficult, like I, I said, you know, I want to make sure I, I don't go too far over time or anything, but like, approaching that, mm -hmm. uh, obviously there's a bunch of stuff that gets learned before the, the I'm sorry, after the stuff of Maniac Mansion, right? Because mm -hmm. you've gone, you went through Secret Monkey Island, Secret Monkey Island 2, and, and mm -hmm. obviously there's other people also doing games like, you know, Fate of Atlantis or something that are using your system. So right. the system itself is kind of growing and yeah. evolving. Mm -hmm. So obviously what you just described and, you know, like you said, it, triangular walk boxes, or mm -hmm. I'm sorry, uh, trapezoidal walk boxes, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. um, Basically, like, you know, from wherever that sort of ended and your, where, wherever your thinking process ended, and, and I guess maybe at Humongous, you maybe would have revisited a bunch of design ideas for internals there. From that, starting out now, are, is what you're building similar to the last thing you built at, say, Humongous or something? I don't know if that's the most current, if, if that was like the most current architectural thinking that you've done on the problem or, or whatever. Um, 
how similar is it, would you say? Like, how much is the same and how much of it's different? Like, what's, what's the, give me a little idea there. Uh, it's, it's fairly similar. Okay. Uh, you know, I wanted, um, you know, I wanted the structure of the language to feel a lot like, you know, the structure okay. that the SCUM system had, the yeah. way rooms were laid out and objects were laid out and objects had verbs and the way that the code for the verbs was embedded in the objects. All that stuff, I, you know, I felt worked really well for an adventure okay. game. So I, I definitely replicated, you know, all of that uh, in the new system. Uh, so I'm interested in one thing you said there. The code for the verbs is embedded in the objects. So mm -hmm. that means that when someone's designing something, they design the, just, I guess, unpack that statement for <laughs> sure. those of us who don't know. Yeah, uh, it's like, well, if you look at the code, right, yeah. you, you, would, you would, you know, object, and then you define an object, like okay. object, you know, front door, okay. right, and a little curly brace, yeah. and then you'd have, you know, the name of the object, and yeah. some flags for the object, and local yeah. variables for the object. Yeah. Then inside of that, you would then have a statement that says verb okay. open, okay. curly brace, and a bunch of code and a close brace. So that was the code that got run when you opened the object. Okay. That code got run. And you know, that, that just always kind of made a lot of sense to me you know, so in terms of structure. It's sort of, it's its own, it, it's like a literal object-oriented programming. Like we literally have yes. objects and they <laughs> yes. literally do encode the things they can yes. do. Yes in reality, right. in this game, right, if that makes sense. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, and so that's kind of just the, the general idea when the designer or scripter or whoever's coming in to do this particular presentation, they think in terms of objects more in isolation in that yes. way. And is that so that you can make multiple, is, that, is, is it the standard maybe object-oriented, uh, like I guess, uh, approach there where it's like, the idea is that I can just code one door and, and stamp them down, or like, mm -hmm. why, why do you like that, I guess? So what, what was I, the benefit to well, that? Well, I like that idea because it focuses kind of the, the function of the thing in one place. Okay. Right, if there's a, a door or there's a key or there's a you know, rubber chicken or whatever, okay. it just keeps everything compact together. Okay. But this is the rubber chicken with the pulley in the middle object. Right. These are all the things that you can do with the object and the code is just right there close you know, to what, what, what the object is. So it's basically like an organizational technique, yes. if you will. It's like, so at some level it doesn't actually matter whether the thing's embedded in this or not, but it, what does matter is I kind of want to know object, all the things it can do, because yes. that's like sort of the way I want to look right. at this game thing. Right. Exactly. Does that become, like, are, are there problems there? Because like thinking about like regular kind of code, mm -hmm. and maybe this doesn't happen as much in adventure games, uh, but like in, in regular code, you end up with problems where it's, it's sort of the interaction between the objects mm -hmm. is the complex part, mm -hmm. and so it's difficult to sort of partition it off into separate things. Right. Is that not really a problem in adventure games, or it is? And then I guess yeah, I'd I mean, ask that it, question. It's, it's a problem. Okay. I mean, you, you know, you're, you're using objects with other objects yeah. in adventure games. You know, you're using key with the door, yeah. right? And so, you know, you do have, you know, the door object and the key object, and yeah. at some point, you know, one of the two's use verb is yeah. going to get called, and it's going to pass the, you know, the key into the door's use okay. verb. So you do, you know, you do have to deal with that. That's our stuff. stuff. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, you do. All right, but that, on the whole, doesn't isn't the like, I guess what I'm saying is you're not so concerned about seeing the code organized that way, like mm -hmm. pairs of objects, because that's the less common case, I guess, is that the... Yeah, I mean, yeah, I, I think about things as the object. Okay. There is the object and what can the, can object, the object do, do and all the functions that the object can do. And so, this was before object-oriented programming. Right? I, mean, I, I knew, yeah. I mean, I don't think C++ had, was anything more than yeah. a preprocessor at that, that point, yeah, right? Yeah. So, so, I mean, I didn't know anything about that. That was just kind of the way that I really thought about, thought about the verbs, it. yeah. So, um, you know, working on the new game, mm -hmm. uh, was there any big, like, and, and maybe the answer to this is no, because I guess you did have a lot of time to refine it since, you know, you actually did two whole companies worth, I guess, right? You did mm -hmm. Lucasfilm ones and the Humongous ones, which mm -hmm. both had an interpreter. Um, well, I guess it's scum both times, but it's like your, it yeah, your, it evolved, you know, yeah. your evolved scum. Mm -hmm. Your evolved scum, I don't know what that is. <laughs> this is some scum I've been evolving. <laughs> Here it is, it's wonderful. Um, so. Was there anything that you sat down uh, on, on like the VM side of things or the scripting side of things, was there anything that you went into it going, you know, 
yes, I've done this a billion times, but I really, this time, I kind of want to solve problem X. We just, we never got it. Mm -hmm. Like, was there anything like that that you sat down thinking about? Or was it always just like, no, like, we're pretty, like, I was pretty happy with where we ended up, you know, at sort of like maybe the, at the end of the humongous titles. Mm -hmm. I feel like I got most of the problems I want to solve. Or was mm -hmm. there some things that you're just like, this time, I'm not going to have problem X. Or this time, I'm going to fix this thing that always bothered me. Does that make sense? As yeah, a question? I don't, I don't think there was. Okay. I don't think there was a, right. a big thing. Again, you know, I was trying to replicate those yes. classic games, and I knew exactly what I needed to do to do that, and I really did feel that the scum language did what I what needed, it needed to, to do, do with that stuff. I mean, there's, you know, the scum language was compiled, so, you know, you'd make changes and you run a compiler, and it would compile right. it, and then you'd upload it. You know, now the compilation just happens in the engine at runtime. Right, right. Right, so you know, there's a bunch of steps that have kind of been removed. removed. You know, I, I no longer need a heap right. because I basically have infinite memory, memory yeah. you know, yeah. to work with. So there, there's a bunch of things that are just simpler, yes. you know, to, to, to deal with. But I, I always like the structure. I like the way the multitasking worked in SCUM. I replicated all of that. It just, it just, it worked for me, so. So how did the multitasking work in SCUM? Well, the, multi, the multitasking, uh, with, on Scum, you're, there were basically scripts, which were yes. now just the functions. Right. And when you and this is like what you were saying in the door. If I have door open, mm -hmm. there's some code in here. Right. That would be sort of the type of thing we would be talking about. Yeah. Or, okay. Yeah. Little, so that's going to execute in the Scum VM. Right. And but but the thing the thing that I you know wanted to do with the Scum system was I wanted the objects to be uh, you know a little bit self-contained. Okay. Like if you know the clock. Uh, needed to tick and it needed to move its little pendulum. Yeah, I just wanted to have a little piece of code that just moved the pendulum. Right. right? I didn't want to have to have a big state engine that you right. jumped into yeah. and you know, had to spawn out to all the different pieces for something. I, see. I just wanted a little function. So the, I mean, one of the coolest things to me was the scum system had a do loop that had no until or while on it. Okay, okay. It was just do, open brace, close brace, right. and it would just run like right. that. And so that script would just sit there and do whatever it needed to do. And you could spawn off all of these different scripts for all these different objects and really let the objects deal with themselves in a way. And how did you deal? I mean, I guess for the most part, in, in most circumstances you're describing, these do loops, I would know that I wouldn't have to execute one if I'm not in the room with that object. But mm -hmm. I would imagine sometimes maybe I, I even do. And so like, how did you? How do you manage the fact that we could have tons of objects doing do loops, and which ones do I do now? Like, like what, what did that sort of look like, I guess? Is that... Well, there were, there were two kinds of functions. Okay. There were global functions and local functions. Okay. Local functions were local to the room. Okay. So when you left the room, all of the threads running that were local functions just got killed. Killed. Right? So you didn't have to manage that. So only the global functions were the ones that would you know, spin uh, you know, outside, uh, outside the rooms. And objects could implement global functions or local functions inside yeah. them? So yeah, you right. can kind of just say, this is something that has to happen all the time, or it's something mm -hmm. that only happens when you're in the room with this particular object right. or whatever. Yeah, like the clock ticking, you only care about but that if thread I can running see it. if the clock is there. Where another function that's maybe you know waiting for the shopkeeper to get yes. back from looking right. for the swordmaster, yes. that's got to be a global function that's the certain ones. I see. Mm -hmm. uh, so all right. So taking the example that I asked before with the walk system, right, the walk mm -hmm. box and so on. So tell me a little bit about your approach to that now, right? Because like again, at the time, like we were uh, saying, like okay, I got to make all the boxes, and then mm -hmm. we by hand put mm -hmm. in like the thing. By the time you had gotten to, say, the, uh, like, uh, maybe the end of the LucasArts, so let's, let's say Monkey Island 2, mm -hmm. were you still manually entering in the walk paths, or did you yeah. already kind of, yeah? No, we were still manually entering okay. those. So how about End of Humongous? Um, we, didn't, we didn't have walk boxes in Humongous. Oh. Yeah, because the characters uh, in the Humongous games, yeah. they didn't really kind of walk around the rooms in the same way. I guess they kind of animated yeah, to they different were, they, stations. Yeah, they were, okay. they were more animated stuff, so they didn't really have to pathfind okay. in the same way. So now, in this game, like I've, I've even seen the videos of Timberly Park with you walking the character around, so mm -hmm. obviously it is pathfinding. Yes, so we have, have walk boxes. Oh, really? Okay. <laughs> yes. So what did you set it up? You still do walk boxes? Do you still enter in manually? No, no, I okay. don't. Well, I did for about a month. 
<laughs> awesome. <laughs> the first month I okay. was manually entering okay. all the stuff by hand. Okay. Um, but yeah, I mean the walk boxes uh, in you know in the, in the new system for Thimbleweed Park, and they're still walk boxes, but they can now just be insided polygons. Right, right. Right. They don't have to be you know squares yeah. or even trapezoids. They can just yeah. be anything that we can really twist yeah. around. Yeah. You know the objects. Yeah. And then you know at runtime. You know, it'll, it'll kind of split the, you know, those polygons up into, you know, little triangles and stuff. To okay, make the so you like <clears throat> do a generic kind of polygon thing mm -hmm. that you can make whatever you want. Right. This is the walkable area. Mm -hmm. And then we will go ahead and tessellate that for you. Exactly. And also figure out the connectivity that yeah. we used to by hand. And then, yeah. then from there, the system is pretty similar? Yeah, then it's, it's actually very similar okay. at that point. You know, the, the stuff that happens under the hood is, is very similar. Awesome. It's just we've removed that, that kind of human step. That's just all done by all you know, robots. <laughs> <laughs> all right, so let me check how much time we got here. I don't actually know. So 518, I don't even know. My, my handwriting is so bad that I can't even read what I wrote down. Let's see. Yeah, it's definitely not handwriting hero. So this is 520, it says. I think we don't have to. So, so correct me if I'm wrong, but this was 535 that I was supposed to write down here, right? So we have, we have easily probably 20 or 30 minutes left. So this is, this is, this is pretty good. OK. All right. So <clears throat> I guess uh, I just kind of want to drill down on a couple things here that we sort of already talked about, but that are, that are maybe a little bit more, uh, a, a little bit more processy, let's say. So uh, you now have a, a situation, and, and, I, and I guess this would have been true, for example, going back to something like Secret of Monkey Island 2 or something, where you actually have a fair number of people working on this game, right? Mm -hmm. So it's like there's a lot of uh, rooms to create, there's a lot of objects, a lot of scripts to write, and that sort of stuff. Um, so what's the process like, you, you know, what's the tool set like for building this, like, like walk boxes, for example, mm -hmm. right? Do you tend to do a lot of like rolling tools as necessary? Like, was this a thing where you know, uh, I'm, maybe maybe Mac Mansion, I put in the coordinates by hand or something, and then later on we make a tool for drawing? Like, can you tell me a little bit about like the tooling up process mm -hmm. as you sort of uh, you know go through the the various games? Especially because now I know you guys had like hot loading on a Vax or whatever. I just want to know like <laughs> like what did it actually look like to make this thing? Because you know it, it, there's a couple of different levels. And by the, and at the same token, you were entering lockbox things by hand. So I have no right. idea. I can't even yeah, guess yeah, yeah, where yeah. things would fall on your tooling level, if that makes sense. Yeah, we 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 had to you know by the time Monkey Island rolled around, mm -hmm. and and really that was because you know by the time Monkey Island rolled around, we were you know we were working on PCs, okay. right? We weren't working on Commodores anymore, so we okay. had a lot more. Um, we weren't do, we weren't working on the Vax machines at okay. that point. You know, at that point we were doing our coding and compiling on the PCs that we were running, you know, running the games on. And were you still able to retain sort of the hot loading stuff when you moved? Not to that not as not as nicely. Really? Yeah, yeah. I mean, okay. a lot of that stuff went away. You Was know, that difficult? Or? Um, you know, not really, just okay. because there were so many other benefits. You okay. know, when you're working on a Commodore 64 with 19K of heap space, yeah. you know, when you have suddenly 120K of heap space okay. on a PC, it's, you know, it's like Nirvana, right? So <laughs> I think, you know, you're kind of happy to leave some of that stuff, you know, on, okay. on the roadside. Um, so, you know, tool-wise, we did have tools. We, we had our own animation tool that we did. Okay. That was, um, and we had our own character editor tool. And okay. we had our own um, um, room layout tool. So the, okay. the tool that we laid out rooms was called Phlegm. Everything followed the scum. Okay. We had like Phlegm and Mucus and Bile. Oh and you know, those okay. were all the tool names. Okay. So, all right. uh, you know, Phlegm was the tool that you lay the rooms out in. And, you know, that basically would bring the art in. The, all the art was done in D-Paint. Okay. Uh, and so that would just bring in these, you know, dot .lbm rooms from yeah. D-Paint. And it would load them in. And then you could go through, you know, with your cursor and you would tag the objects on the screen, okay. and you would lay down the walk boxes. Got so it. that was all done visually. Okay. You know, in, in so the there's basically like a form. markup process that yeah. happens in there. And so what does that look like today? So for Thimbleweed Thimble Park, similar, different? I, you know, I, I'm probably, I guess, the most unoriginal person in the world. I built a tool that you bring in <laughs> Photoshop files, yep. and you mark objects, and you lay down walk boxes. So, so it's, it's like it is exactly <laughs> the same process. <laughs> yeah, it is. Well, hey, man, if it works, It right? works, yeah. OK, and so uh, what, what sorts of stuff happened? And, and maybe the answer is people just got really good at it or what. But 
what sort of stuff happened once you start expanding, even perhaps on Maniac Mansion, I don't know, but obviously it probably didn't have much of a, much you could do about it, but maybe later on. You know, that scripting sort of system and like the scum VM and all that stuff, like you're starting to make a significant chunk of what happens in the game is going through this system. Mm -hmm it becomes hard with no tools, perhaps, to debug problems, like, because we don't know, you know, why did the clock stop ticking? We don't mm -hmm. know, right? Mm -hmm. At what point, or, you know, did you start having, or did you ever have, like, tools for looking at that? Was there inspection, that sort of stuff? Mm -hmm. How did, like, what, what did that sort of look like? Yeah, I mean, once we didn't have the Unix machines where we could, yeah. you know, look at all the memory, you know, we had to do that on the PC. Okay, so tell me a little about that. So on the Unix machines, you would actually just sort of freeze the Commodore 64's execution, mm -hmm. and just you just inspect the memory yourself? You inspect or? the memory, yeah. And okay. I mean, that was, that was pretty crude. Okay. Um, but by the time that the, the PC version came about, um, you know, we all had kind of second monitors. You know, we bought like, you know, cheap black and white okay. you know, Hercules monitors. Okay. And so we had, you know, the main PC thing, we had a secondary you know, black see. and white monitor, which we did all the debugging in. Okay. And, you know, at that point we could do source level debugging. Okay. So, you know, we could stop and we could single step and the source code would just show up on the secondary monitor and we could just, you know, I step see. through the lines of the source code. So you actually had fairly, that's on Maniac Mansion even? No. Or no, that's Maniac okay, because Mansion never shipped on the PC? Or, yeah, we never okay. had that on Okay, Mansion. so that was on Monk Island or? Yeah, that was, that was, it started with Loom and then. Oh, okay, it started with Loom. Yeah, Loom okay. was really the first full PC game, game. that we had done. Okay, and so at that point, you guys decided, hey, we should probably have a debugger for this stuff. Yeah. There's so much, it's hard to like actually figure out what's going on in the scripts. Right. Let's do it here. Mm -hmm. Thimbleweed Park. Uh, Thimbleweed Park, um, I don't have a source level debugger. Okay. And that's one thing I don't have uh, that I, I hope to write, you know, yep. someday so I can do that. The debugging is a lot easier. I mean, the language is a lot more dynamic. Okay. So, you know, there is like a little, a little debug window, which I can actually type in commands, you know, actual okay. language commands, you know, call functions, change variables, and do all that. And kind you have of some stuff. kind of dumping, I assume, so you yeah. like print out this object, so you kind of, you kind of have some Yeah, it's, I mean, it's, okay. it's back to printf debugging, yeah. right? I mean, yeah. that's kind of how you do this. Okay. Way. So basically, like, uh, in, in some sense, now in Thimbleweed Park, you rely on, I guess that's typically called like a top level or something like this, people call it, like the ability to, Typing code dynamically yeah. gives you the ability to sort of like, okay, well, I can go in and if I'm wondering why somebody's mm -hmm. doing something, I can print out some of the state, or I can also kind of twiddle with things and see right. if that you can change was what it was. You or can just you know. call functions to okay. you know kick the game into a certain state or whatnot. And do you do a lot of the <clears> stuff <throat> on Thimbleweed Park in terms of creating those scripts, or do you like is that do you have people who are doing game scripting at? Uh, is it, is it more similar to like the Monk Allen case where it's like yeah, there's people doing shipping and you're doing the end? Yeah, there's one other person, uh, David okay. Fox, and you know, coincidentally, he was the other scripter on Maniac Mansion. Okay. Right? So, so it's exactly the team because yeah. Gary Winnick was the artist of Maniac Mansion. Right, and I'm you're doing the, the engine and scripting, and okay. David is doing the scripting. So it's like we're all just older, and, and you know, okay. it's yeah. really, you know, about yeah. it. Okay. Um, yeah, so you know, he does probably the bulk of the scripting. You know, okay. I, I, my time is probably split between, you know, building the engine and doing scripting stuff. Although most of my scripting tends to be more experimental stuff. It's like I'll add some new feature, and so I'll program a part of the I game see. that needs that feature. To see. Well, yeah, where David will then kind of go off and do more of the nuts and bolts uh, scripting. So are there any new features in the VM that you're using now, uh, or sorry, that you've built now, mm -hmm. uh, that were like very different from the scum mm -hmm. way? Like was there, was there anything, or is it like, no, no. Like it is basically scum, like I just kind of did, you know, a, a new take on, you know, the, the exact same thing, or was there like, have you experimented, Cause especially when you say experimental scripting for features, are those just features that used to be in Scum that you haven't implemented in yours yet, or are those new features where you're like, I think it would be nice if Adventure Game Scripting Language had this? Yeah, I mean, there, there are a lot of new features, just, just to make, okay. you know, in the language, just okay. coding things, okay. you know, functions we can call. Um, you know, the game is all kind of, you know, classic 8-bit, yeah. you know, art okay. stuff, except we have shaders. Right? Okay, okay. We can do lighting. Right? Okay. So, so the lights in the world actually project light you okay. know, out and they actually shade the characters as they walk I around. See. And, and so, you know, there's stuff like that that's kind of new. Okay. And, you know, so, you know, I create commands in the language to be able to control the lights. Because we see. want the lights to be able to blink on and off right, and do right. all these other things. So it's just tying, you know, all of these new, you know, features that we have in the engine back into the scripting language and how all that. Stuff works. But what if 
the charm of old adventure games was that they didn't have lighting. <laughs> you're, 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 you're ruining that one, you know, you never know, right? It's like, uh, I guess well, there was some, though, I guess. Well, I mean, right. when, I, when I did the Kickstarter, it's like my goal was, it wasn't to make a classic adventure game the way they were. Yeah. It was to make a classic adventure game the way you remember them. Okay, right? I see. Because people don't remember those games exactly like they were, I right? See. They, they kind of extrapolate the graphics out to much better than they really I were. See. And so I wanted to be able to kind of remain true and pure to the 8-bit stuff. I see. But I'm not opposed to using shaders I see. to get some really nice, you know, subtle lighting effects on everything because I think that's the way people remembered those games okay. you know, I in see. their heads. And that makes sense. So it's kind of like saying, we're trying, to, we're trying to reproduce your memory of Monkey Island, not the actual yes. Monkey Island, because the exactly. actual Monkey Island, you might be like, ah, that doesn't look so yeah, good. Exactly. Right? Or so, it's like, <laughs> and so we want to take that away. So it's yeah. got to walk, I guess, almost like a fine line between it can't look like a completely modern game because then it obviously isn't Monkey Island, but we can't go all the way back to exactly what it looked like because it's too far. So you're kind right. of like in this middle ground of trying to like nail what did you remember? Right. It's, this it's the feeling. It's, it's the, feeling. the feeling of playing those games. And, and, you know, we can certainly do a little more with the hardware. You know, I can actually do scaling, you know, through the GPU, and I can do stuff like that now that, uh, you know, we just we couldn't do back then. What's your approach been to, this is kind of a little off topic, but I just kind of realized I hadn't even written this down. What's your approach been to music over time? Because I feel like, you know, uh, in, in sort of the... I want to say Monkey Island 2, maybe. Uh, it kind of had very, very advanced interactive music for its yeah, time period, the right? The iMuse system. Yeah, the iMuse thing. And, yeah. and, uh, and then, like, I don't really know what you guys did at, with the humongous titles necessarily, because uh, a lot of those actually featured more heavily sort of recorded, like, produced stuff, which mm -hmm. couldn't probably be so interactive. But what's your... What was your feeling about those? Was that something you really weren't that interested in anyway, and maybe some other people went off and did it, or did you care a lot about the music? And what's your approach to it now? Can you give me, some, yeah, like I said, this was never on the list, but I just kind of thought of it, and I was like, should ask. Well, I mean, the iMuse system, which did probably one of the most amazing interactive music systems I've ever seen. Okay. And it was, it was amazing, and it was incredible to work in. It was, it was time consuming. Okay. I mean, we had, uh, you know, one whole game scripter who did nothing but hook in all the music cues really? for stuff for Monkey Island 2. So, you know, it was, it was intensive to yeah. do that kind of stuff. But iMuse really became not possible with the whole digital revolution of stuff because iMuse was still just playing notes, MIDI, you know, yeah. on MIDI cards or whatever. Yeah. And when digital music hit the scene, it really couldn't, you couldn't do what iMuse did yeah. anymore. And, and so I think it just kind of lost a little bit of, of that stuff. But, you know, music, the music in Thimbleweed Park, I kind of describe as fully modern. Okay. I'm, I'm not a big fan of, like, chip tunes, and I'm okay. not, not okay. a big fan of that stuff. Okay. And, and so I just, I felt like music kind of embodies such a, kind of an emotional tone for okay. the game that I really just wanted the music to be, to be full and really nice and really good music for the game. And do you think that, like, so uh, is that something that's kind of missing nowadays in some sense? Would you say, uh, like your description of the iMuse uh, mm -hmm. system, or, or I guess the results of the iMuse system, and having gone to digital and sort of losing most of that, mm -hmm. is that something that you think we kind of need to get back at some point, like as a technological problem? Like what, or do you think that games don't really suffer much from not having that technology? Like what, what's, what's your take on it as, as someone who's made games with and without it? Yeah, I, and I think... I think really sadly, I think music is kind of ignored for the okay. most part okay. in games. And, okay. and it's, it's too bad that it is. I mean, I'm not a music person. I know okay. nothing about music. Right? Sure. I, I could not, I do not play an instrument. Yeah. I, I couldn't name the notes for okay. you, right? Yeah. So, uh, you know, I, I kind of entrust that there are other people that do that kind of stuff really okay. well. But I really enjoyed working with the IMU system. I enjoy okay. kind of interactive music. You know, the, in, in that the music, the thing about the music in Monkey Island 2 and the IMU system was that was one continuous piece of music yes. from the time the game started until the game ended. And, but as you kind of move through the world, it just slowly changed to match the different rooms you were in, the different areas of the game you were in, and it was just, it was seamless and flawless. And 
I miss that. Yeah. Right? I miss, I like having that, that nonstop music going on, but it does need to emotionally change as you work your way through the world. Yeah. And it just needs to happen very subtly so you don't realize that it's changing. So what's your approach in Thimbleweed Park to this? You just kind of blend between yeah, I mean the, pieces the, or? The approach that we're using in Thimbleweed Park is the musician is writing a whole lot of these little 10 second little pieces of music. Mm -hmm. And he's writing them so they can chain. So the end of one piece can chain to the beginning of you know, virtually any other piece. And I just have these pools of music and I can just switch pools. And so the most that you'll lag is 10 seconds while it kind of finishes one piece and then transitions into another piece. So, so it can do just kind of wall-to-wall -wall music. That's not that far off from iMuse then. In it's, some it's, sense, it's, it's, not. I mean, it's getting iMuse, some of it back. iMuse could do it on a note-by-note by note note level, right? right? Yes, yes. Where here, I'm yeah. kind of chunked into the, yeah. you know, the, the, but that, the 10 seconds. But so in some sense, you are, I guess, trying to sort of recapture yeah, that same feel, bit, yeah. uh, because obviously, you know, you could have done something where it's like, I fade one out and fade the other one in, right? right so you're, yeah. you're actually kind of going uh, to a certain distance that actually many games don't go. Like many games actually will not have music that can chain mm -hmm. in that way. They just kind of like fade in and out things yeah. or, you know, abruptly stop. Yeah, and it's, it's what we're trying. I don't, I don't know how successful it's it'll be, be, but I mean, there's a lot of work for the musician, right? Yes, because he has true. to make sure that, that a whole bunch of pieces can yeah. kind of chain into other pieces. Yeah, without and, there being and, too much abruptness. And yeah. You have to kind of carry over. Yeah. Of, so it's, it's a know. lot of work on his part yeah. to do. All right. Well, that's actually very interesting. I didn't know that. Let's see, let's see how we're doing on time. So I think we're kind of getting to where we should probably start wrapping up. I think I got, actually, most of the things uh, that I wanted to ask, but I will point out the fact that earlier in the day, when Mike Acton was up here, he wanted to know if creating cutscenes had always been a problem, and he <laughs> wanted to hear that from the person who... I, did you guys even coin that phrase? Yes. I want to say you're like the people who introduced the phrase cutscene. It is true. Yes. So tell me a little, well, first, we might as well, since this is, uh, this is uh, entirely self-indulgent for me, <laughs> tell me how that comes about. Like, games don't have cutscenes, mm. and now they do. What, well, what happened? I mean, games had interstitials. Yeah. Right? Games had little canned animated sequences. That was not something we created. Yeah. Um, the word cutscene, yeah. that was something that we definitely coined. And, and it came from, in Maniac Mansion, um, you'd be playing the game, and the game would literally just cut away and show you what was happening in Dr. Fred's lab, or Nurse Edna's room, or Weird Ed's room, or something. And, I mean, it, it did it very crudely, in the fact that there was just a little timer running, and, you know, when 18 minutes expired, it would just, no matter what you were doing, right, you could be right I in the see. middle of solving some really important puzzle, and we just cut away, right? Gotcha. And so they, they were scenes that cut away from the game. Yes. So they were called cutscenes. And there was even a, a command in the scum language called cutscene. Okay. And it was, it was a very sophisticated command in that when you'd run a cutscene, it would kind of save the game state away, right. go off and do the cutscene, and when the cutscene ended, it would just automatically restore the game state to where you were before. So it kind of takes the VM's state at this time, <clears throat> dumps it, go load this entire other state, and then as soon as we're done, it's kind of like a, yeah. you know, an excursion, if you will, yeah. where it's like, and then we're just gonna like full on romp over that with the new right. thing. Yes. Okay. Okay, so that's actually probably one of the harder things to implement in Scum, because yeah, everything yeah. has to work right through that pipeline. Yeah, that was, I mean, that was definitely a sophisticated, yet yeah. really powerful uh, feature that the language had. So, <clears throat> Mike wants to know, were cutscenes always a problem? Like, <laughs> like our cutscene, were cutscenes, I guess implementing them was, but I mean, for, for the artists creating them and that sort of stuff. No, no. They, they weren't, they okay. weren't a problem. Okay. Because they... <laughs> <laughs> You're doing something wrong. I don't know what to say, but some, somewhere between Monkey Island and Hit here. Hit me up after the yeah, talk. Yeah. I'll straighten you out on that. <laughs> um, they weren't a problem because they were all hand-coded. Right. Right. We, we didn't have a tool that we built these cutscenes on. If, if we needed Nurse Edna to walk around the room while she was saying something, we literally had code that walked her here, then walked, walked her, her there. there. So we didn't have that, came, that same you know, asset export problem that, you know, cutscenes have today because, you know, they're coming out of these big tools. Is that, so I should ask uh, that actually about the sort of, we talked about the multiprocessing thing um, and creating cutscenes and that sort of stuff because my recollection, again, and it's been a very long time, I guess, since I played it, but my recollection 
uh, even, even in Monkey Island, uh, but I think almost certainly in Monkey Island too, there were definitely places where the, the uh, and putting away sort of what your definition of cutscene was there, mm -hmm. there's definitely places where scripted sorts of things happened in conjunction with the player still having the freedom to do things, right? Mm -hmm. So there were times when something relatively elaborate, like this guy is gonna go walk off the screen right. and go somewhere, mm -hmm. It, we, you didn't actually freeze the entire player's ability to do stuff. I remember there being some concurrency mm -hmm. there, mm -hmm. uh, even, like I said, as early as Monkey Island. And maybe that's my memory being bad, but that's mm -hmm. my, that's, my recollection. That's correct. That is correct. Um, what did that kind of look like at that time? Because, you know, that's sort of a really hard problem, especially, you know, again, when you're talking about a very limited system that has a lot of constraints to even mm -hmm. just do the basic stuff it does. Now we're talking about sort of the sort of thing that was like, you know, Half-Life 2 was struggling to do these sorts of things, right? So we're talking about how do we uh, have the ability to script something that has to happen, but we don't really know what the player was doing at this time. Mm -hmm. uh, was that something that you guys thought a lot about, or was it just because, hey, we tried to keep it so that it really wouldn't be a problem? Or what, like, what was that like at the time? Because that must have been, that was a really early attempt to do something like this, and yeah, you know, it that, went that, surprisingly well. It's a really hard problem, yeah. because you know, I think players intrinsically just want to fuck up everything you're doing, right? <laughs> they, they just do. Yeah. And so, you know, it's, it, it's, it's not that we could have this scene where, you know, you're following the shopkeeper into the forest to find the swordmaster. We really couldn't plan that the player was going to do exactly what we wanted them to do. Yes. Follow behind him, yeah. you know, stay in the seat yeah. in the back. No, it's not what players do. And players want to run up in front of him. Yeah, they want yeah. to do all of these things. So, yeah, I mean, we had, we had to do with it. We had to deal with all that stuff. And, and I think... You know, the way we solved a lot of that stuff is, is you just cheat as much as you can. Okay. You know, so when the, when the shopkeeper is walking from his store to the swordmaster, he's not literally walking through those rooms, right? He, he walks to the door and he leaves, and then we just kind of do a little bit of timer stuff. There's just a timer running. And so when you walk into the next room, we just put the shopkeeper close to the exit and just have him walk off the screen, right? right? So you can't so, possibly catch yeah. him or whatever. And if the timer had, went, went too far, then you just lost him and he didn't appear. I see. So it's, just, it's all about just creating weird little shortcuts and cheating your way through the problem as much as you can. Well, I think we are just about out of time. Uh, yep, we are. So thank you so much. That well, was like, you. that was extremely enjoyable for me. Those are like so many things I wanted to know. But thank you so much. Yeah, thanks.